Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am James Jordan, and this is Parterre Saturday Afternoon, um, a program that I'm hoping will become uh, a vital part of your week uh, every Saturday afternoon uh, between May and I think November. Uh, I'm going to be on, uh, with the occasional exception, to present a live opera performance as recorded sometime in the past and uh, some give you a chance to do some chatting as well. Um, I'm hoping that you'll enjoy today's performance, which is a performance of Giordano's opera Fedora. Um, it was performed in 1971 in Como near Milan, and it features the magnificent and legendary artist Magda Olivero, who was about 60 at the time of this performance. She sings opposite Giuseppe Giacomini, the famous dramatic tenor who was then right toward the beginning of his career and he was just about 30. So this is uh, in um, in a nutshell what Magda Oliveira's career was like. She never did things the way anyone else did them and um, she uh, seemed to become greater and greater and greater as she grew older and older and older. Um, uh, this was actually, let's see, 1971 is and four years before her debut at the Metropolitan Opera. And uh, I remember speaking to uh, someone who was there in 1979 when Magda Olivero went on as Tosca. She was substituting for, as I understand it, Birgit Nilsson, who was singing Zieglinda, substituting for Leonie Rusnak. But that is not the important part. Um, what I was told by this colleague of mine was uh, everyone was there not to hear a performance and not to find out how well Magda Olivero sang, but basically they were waiting for her to fall off the stage. That she, They thought she was a joke. They thought she was total camp. They thought there's no possible way that a 65-year-old soprano could make her Metropolitan Opera debut, as Tosca in particular, and have a success. And wow, were they surprised because she had a huge triumph. Um, uh, applause before, after, and during the performance at all sorts of moments, um, including famously, and I don't have that recording with me right now, famously uh, a, a loud burst of applause after she sang the high C in Act 3, which is right in the middle of a phrase, so it isn't even, uh, there isn't even a place to applaud there, but that didn't stop people. Um, Olivero continued to sing for another five years, I think, after that, and uh, eventually retired at the age of 70. After a very long but interrupted career. She took about 10 years off during the 1940s and returned uh, in the 1950s. Anyway, there's a lot more to say about Magda Olivero, but right now I should probably tell you a little bit about Fedora. Uh, Fedora is based on a play by Victoria Sardou that was written as a vehicle for Sarah Bernhardt. Um, Sarah Bernhardt was not only a very famous actress and a very great actress, but she was also a very unusual actress in that for the time, uh, she was known for having a very mercurial per personality on stage that you could never tell what she was going to do next. So every performance was was uh, just sort of a sort of a thrill show of what was going to happen next, uh, which was apparently a very different thing from the way most actresses performed in those days, a much more stately way of of, uh, of doing the show. So I'd like to read a little bit um, of a review from the New York Times of Sarah Bernhardt's Fedora, which she brought on tour to New York in, I think, 1883. Let me let me check the date on that. Um, that would be 1887. So this is about four or five, five or six years after the play's debut. Uh, she toured quite constantly, including many tours to the United States, always performing in French and was one of the great attractions in those days. And this review, which was in the New York Times in 1887, reads like a review Ben Brantley might write about Bernadette Peters. It is a complete rave. Um, the, the critic writes, Sardou's Fedora, the strongest drama written in recent years with Sarah Bernhardt as the heroine, a character unquestionably suggested by the eccentric French actress's remarkable skill in the simulation of conflicting passions, presents a combination of ingenuity, constructive and dramatic eloquence that is not likely to be equaled on the stage within the within the knowledge of playgoers now living. The play is a triumph of realism, and the actress finds in it a medium that calls into use nearly all her wonderful powers of expression. She perfectly fits the role of the passionate, impulsive Muscovite princess in all her ever-changing moods. Her genius lends luster to even the merely colloquial passages of the text, and the exquisite art of the actress is revealed in every scene, and it goes on and on and on about how 
<clears throat> a magnificent Lord Baron Hardy is. So, um, Sarah, of course, is a tough act to follow, but I think Magda Olivero lives up to it. Um, what we're going to hear now are the first two acts of Fedora. Uh, it's an extremely short opera. It's barely 90 minutes of music, so it's hardly worth it, as the Met did when they did the opera about 20 years ago, to take two intermissions. We'll take only the one. Um, in a nutshell, what's happening in Fedora is there is a, there's a princess named Fedora Romazov, and she is the fiancé of a, um, a, a count named Vladimiro, who is the head of the St. Petersburg police. And she arrives at his townhouse expecting to meet him there. I'm not really sure why she's there. It seems a little, a little louche for her to be showing up at her fiancé's townhouse, but she does. Um, but he's not there. And so after she wanders around uh, admiring his tchotchkes, um, she becomes more and more tense because Vladimiro is late. Um, she hears a footstep on the stair and turns, but it is not Vladimiro, but the chief of police who announces that Vladimiro has been assassinated and it's suspected that he has been killed by a nihilist, or nihilist, if you prefer, um, named Loris Ipanov. Um, well, Fedora is enraged and she, she insists on, insists on uh, examining all the witnesses herself. She cross-examines all the witnesses herself and she forces each witness to kneel to her and she holds out a giant bejeweled Byzantine crucifix that she wears around her neck and makes them swear on that sacred cross that they're telling the absolute truth. So having worked out in her head, she's, she's a sort of a combination of Tosca and Jessica Fletcher, she, having worked out in her head that it is in fact Laura Sipanov who has performed this dire deed, and that Laura Zipanov has fled to Paris to avoid prosecution. Fedora follows him there, where she rents a mansion. Um, this woman has unlimited resources. And she gives a big party one night, and her, her plan is that she's going to beguile Loris and make him fall in love with her, and then she will pump him. Uh, for, for information, I mean. She will pump him for information, and then she will find out uh, why he did this, and then she'll be able to take her revenge on him and turn him into the secret police. Well, um, she first gets from Loris the uh, the information that he has uh, he has in fact killed Vladimiro, uh, and um, then she invites him back later that evening, presumably for a tete a tete. But what she really does is she confronts him with the information that she knows that he killed her fiance. Um, well, there actually are extenuating circumstances. It turns out that Loris's wife, Vanda, was having an affair with Vladimiro. And Vladimiro, um, uh, Vladimiro and um, uh, Loris confronted each other and there, there was gunfire and they both reached for the gun. And it turned out that Vladimiro ended up dead. And Fedora, Fedora goes, Oh, well, that's completely different. That's a completely different story. I thought you were a nihilist. And he says, oh, what? No, I mean a nihilist. So he is neither nihilist nor nihilist. In fact, he is just a jealous lover like anyone else in opera. So um, Fedora, uh, Fedora realizes that now she has fallen in love with Loris. And as the saying goes, as night falls, they declare their love. So let's move on now to the first act of Giordano's Fedora. I need to find my... Um, my control panel again. So we're going to move on to the first act of Giordano's Fedora as sung by Magda Olivero and Giuseppe Giacomini. And I'll be back after act two to fill you in on what, less, what else is left to happen to those people. All right, act one of Giordano's Fedora. <laughs>
la camera del conte la camera perito quella donna chi è Fedora Romazzo la principessa si sì. dottore una discendenza un assassino il conte il conte domenica Eccellenza, una domanda sola. Eccellenza, il signore che della polizia. L'assassino! Non cadde ancora in nostra mano, il conte non proferiva un nome. Neppure il nome mio. Aveva qualche nemico. I servi nell'altra stanza. No, restate qui. Scrivete. Silence. 
Thank <laughs> you. 
per gli amici grazie grazie Oh, yeah. 
Vladimir Andreevich e non corri a colparti da suo padre contro tutti e innocente sei davvero Egli... ecco qui proformi ardisci No, 
sempre ho seguito Lori si parò Stasera un uomo sospetto Giunto appena di Russia Gli recava una lettera del fratel Valeriano Il fratello anche lui Mia madre, 
salgo in islista e ratto ritorno a mezzo la via discesa dall'uso del nobile amico ravviso la fante di panda l'insequo la donna vacilla palpetta confessa di fando un biglietto recorla di miro io salgo e gli usci Ecco, mi lascio un istante, io corro il tiretto e trovo che dice che attendo stasera alle nove.
So as the bravi, bravi, bravis ring out, um, we come to the end of the second act of Giordano's Fedora. Um, I should mention along the way that, you know, while it's a wonderful performance and we're here for the performance, uh, we should probably be paying attention to what's going on in the opera. And uh, there are a lot of things going on in this opera. Uh, and there are a lot of plot points that went by in the second act that I didn't, I didn't mention before. Um, Fedora, when she moves to Paris, gathers with her this bizarre coterie of friends, including the blasé princess Olga, the roué de Syriex, and the um, the world-famous Polish 
virtuoso uh, pianist um, Boleslaw Lazinski or something like that. Anyway, he um, and uh, they all have uh, uh, roles to play in the third act. Uh, among the other plot points that we really should remember is that uh, just in casual conversation, someone says to uh, Fedora in the second act, uh, 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 well, you know, we all have our crosses to bear. And speaking of crosses to bear, you're bearing a very beautiful cross there, referring to her heavily jeweled Byzantine crucifix that she wears around her neck at all times. And Fedora, um, I guess just to make conversation, says, oh, you know, that's something that we used to wear uh, in the old country because um, the members of the royal family would at all times have to be ready to commit suicide in case of insurrection. And so they would carry a flask of poison inside this crucifix around their necks. And keep that in mind. Remember, there's poison inside the crucifix because that's going to be important in the last act. Um, we also find out in the second act that Fedora, uh, having understood that um, Loris is the murderer of her fiancé, writes a letter to the chief of the Russian secret police. And then at the last moment, she finds out that um, Loris's brother, whose name escapes me at the moment, uh, Loris's brother was also involved in this murder. So she adds, P.S., his brother is also involved in it and sends that off to the Russian secret police. Um, so we have a uh, we have a lot of stuff that's going to be uh, lining up with uh, we're going to find it out in the last act. Um, now what happens in the last act is really very simple, which is that uh, Fedora and Loris move to Switzerland and they're having an idyllic time there. They're just so in love, and then the telegrams start coming in. Uh, telegrams, messengers, letters, carrier pigeons. I think they're getting texts. It's just. Uh, the most amazing procession of news is coming through to them. So uh, what we find out along the way is that, um, uh, first of all, because we know that Loris was not conspiring against um, uh, against the Russian government, that's not the reason why he killed Vladimir, um, uh, the He's implicated in the the idea that he's going to be um, that, that he that he was a nihilist or a nihilist, and that he should be punished for that. But what what we've forgotten about is that also his brother is involved in this. Now his brother is still back in Russia, and his brother has been arrested, and we get a message from off stage that the brother was put into a dungeon underground, and then the Volga overflowed its banks and drowned him. But wait, it gets worse when. Loris's mother found out about the brother drowning. She died of grief. So Loris is understandably upset by this. And he says, I hear that there is a woman who turned me into the police. If I ever find her, I will kill her. Well, of course, that woman is Fedora. And Fedora realizes that she has been living a, a huge lie and that she also has betrayed the man she loves. And she's killed his brother and she's killed his mother. So she reaches into the she reaches for the crucifix around her neck and swallows the poison. Uh, you can imagine any actress would adore doing a scene like this. Um, so as the poison begins to take its effect, she tries to convince Loris that the woman who betrayed him, who is still unknown to him, that the woman who betrayed him surely was doing it out of the best of reasons. And Loris is having none of that until he suddenly, the dawn breaks, and he says, I know you're the woman who killed my brother and my mother. Uh, so she begs for forgiveness for a while, and then she starts obviously fainting and dying. And even Loris begins to realize that something is wrong. And what he realizes is wrong is that poor Fedora is dying of poison. Now, of course, he's sorry that he, he drove her to this and he keeps, he sends for a doctor and begs for her to live. So there's a, an extended and very beautiful and very unusual death scene where the orchestra plays a reminiscence of his big second act aria, of Loris's second act aria. And Fedora sort of half sings and half mutters, uh, words about how she's approaching death and how only the kiss of Loris can bring her back to life. So it does not end well, but I will not say this is a tragedy. It's very definitely a melodrama. And uh, something I can say about this before I move on is that uh, the one time I've seen Fedora on stage was at the Met about 20 years ago. I was invited to that performance by um, the head of a clack, actually. Um, this uh, fan of Morella Franey has organized a clack 
um, and asked me to join it. And I thought, well, you know, I've never done this before. So we, we assembled before the performance and were given, you know, confetti and roses and things like that and given instructions on when the cheers should come and how enthusiastic the cheers should be. And I had no trouble doing it because it was really a very exciting experience seeing Morella Franey, who has not had that big a New York career, a legendary figure, but she hasn't sung in New York that much. Um, however, along the way, um, I realized that this was really not an ideal role for Morella Franey, that the first act consists in large part a fedora saying one or two words at a time, but mostly listening to other people and reacting. Um, it wants a Faye Dunaway. It wants someone who is really crisp and sharp and ready to go over the top, which Morella Franey most definitely is not. Um, or she's, she's a lovely, lovely, lovely person. But I get the feeling that if her fiancé had been assassinated by a nihilist or a nihilist, her response would be to call the police. It wouldn't be to come up with this elaborate plot of renting a house in Paris and hiring concert pianists and all the other stuff. Um, that's just along the way. Um, it was fun to cheer for Morella Franey, though. Um, so we're going to move on to the third act of Fedora. Please don't run away as soon as the third act is over, because I do have a little bit of extra music, also with Magda Olivero. Um, going to show the astonishing longevity and freshness of her voice even as she approached the age of 70. So first, uh, the third act of Fedora, then we'll be back to talk for just, for just a moment and a little bit more music on today on Parterre, Saturday afternoon. Oh, 
nipote successore di Chopin, il poeta del pianoforte, eccetera. Su, si fidate, mi avanti. Non sarebbe un agente eh? segreto. Una spia. Dall'imperial governo le vostro fianco messa. Per farvi chiacchierà. Fatevi cor contessa, qua giù tutto finisce e tutto ricomincia. Non è la prima volta, né l'ultima sarà. L'amore o gioia ti passa, se viene per andarsene. Sembra per ritornare. Passa! Passa! È passata! Parliamo di più che è meglio cancellare questo brutto ricordo! Con un altro mio re, che so un rapimento, in bicicletta! Bravo, l'idea originale! Torno per te! Che detto lì da sventa! Principessa, non son venuto qui per lei. L'amate molto. Moris, io della vita. Siete dunque felice? Come non so. Oh, 
comandò di tuo fratello Valeriano arrestato la fortezza di fossato nella notte affogato mia madre mia madre madre per me morti innocenti e quella donna la maledetta spia che mi segue sempre ovunque ma la prima con lei per Dio perché fedora da me ti scosti Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, as, as always, I forget to turn on the mic. Um, so we have the end of the last act of Fedora. Uh, Magda Olivero at the age of 60 singing this role. Uh, you will remember, uh, I think we have mentioned this before, that Magda Olivero um, uh, made her Metropolitan, Opera de her Metropolitan Opera debut at the age of 65 in 1975, but this was not the end of her career. Uh, she continued singing for another five or six years after that. And so we now have uh, a snippet from something very near the uh, the end of her career. Um, uh, she actually sang in a number of U.S. cities in the spring of 1979, uh, uh, performances of Tosca opposite Luciano Pavarotti. And uh, naturally, uh, the wags, and you know, there are wags always around opera, the wags called this tour Pav and Mag. So we will hear Pav and Mag, Luciano Pavarotti and Magda Olivero, along with Cornell McNeil, in a couple of scenes from the first act of Tosca, as performed on this tour in the United States in 1979.
And so there we have it, uh, Magda Olivero at the age of 69 in the spring of 1979, uh, performing the role of Tosca opposite Luciano Pavarotti and Cornel McNeil. Um, and uh, but beyond that, I can't think of anything more remarkable, uh, an incredible 
incredible vocal technique and incredible vocal longevity and incredible energy. You know, she she could have retired many years before and taught and done all of the kind of things, but you know, she she had this holy mission. She had this mission to to go out and sing in Tosca and as we heard before in Giordano's Fedora. So um, I will continue my own mission of bringing these performances to you every Saturday afternoon. Two weeks from now, uh, I maybe shouldn't talk about being quite so holy a mission since I'm going to be missing uh, next weekend, uh, but I'm missing it for a very good purpose. Uh, the reason is that um, I don't want to try to overload people with things to watch. And so um, next weekend on Sunday at 11 a.m., that's Sunday a week from now, at 11 a.m., there will be a, uh, a live webcast from the Bayerische Städtsopper uh, in Munich, and it will be Parsifal, and it is an incredible all-star cast uh, in, in a new production by Pierre Audi. And um, so you really definitely be, need to be watching that. Check Parterre.com, which is our home base, P-A-R-T-E-R-E.com, our home base, uh, for more details on that and more details on upcoming uh, upcoming live streams from Parterre Saturday afternoon. Uh, we will be back in two weeks. I haven't decided yet what we'll be broadcasting at that time. But again, on Parterre, you can see uh, what our future broadcasts will be, what other future important broadcasts will be that you're invited to discuss and to enjoy. And also, we have an opera calendar for the New York area that lists... Uh, I won't say all performances because if you get past us, but uh, if you're looking for an opera to go to on any given day of the week, uh, parterre.com is the place to go because we have a calendar there that will tell you what's playing in New York uh, from the smallest to the largest theaters. And so from uh, what is now uh, not a very large uh, live cast, but I hope it will grow in the future. Uh, my name is James Jordan and good afternoon from Parterre Saturday afternoon. <laughs>